Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about Rebel Moon, part 1 and 2. First off, this is a Zack Snyder uh, enterprise, so to speak. And I'm going to say I'm glad and I hope it does well. I'm a little conflicted on how it's set up, but... To get to these things first, I would think that the production and the vision for this is legit, but there's a lack of certain substance in it, but I could be getting old, and if this is how a production on a vision of someone's um, idea and passion is brought to fruition, I'm, I'm okay with it, and I'm actually excited for it. In a sense that it's, um, you know, you you make big movies and he's been lambasted by me rightfully for some of the bullshit he does, Zack Snyder, in, in a general sense. But I love 300. Uh, there's a couple of movies I, I enjoy. Not that I think they're critically you know, meta amazing movies. And I talk about me having just the understanding of I might love a movie, but I know it's not good. But if you're going to start a new trend, you're going to you know, change the way movies are done, especially with the pandemic happening. And um, some things really force change in some of the, these industries. And I'm glad Zack Snyder is there to do this. And that sounds weird, again, if you go through most of my podcasts that I've done on his movies, I, I really can't stand some of them. And, but that's just in the aspect of him trying to get across his movie and how it's going to play off on audiences and me particularly, obviously. And one of my things is like, repeatability, can I watch it again? So getting sort of that sort of out of the way, I decided to do... Uh, part one and part two. I think part one is Child of Fire, and part two is um, The Scar Giver. It's directed by Zack Snyder, um, starring Sofia Boletta, uh, Ed Screen, Jimon Hansu, Ray Fisher. There's some names you'll see and recognize. Again, starting this podcast with the general workings of is this going to be a vision is this how the future will work if it's going to be quality like this if it's going to have names where you could get your production your vision set you have a limited theatric theatrical release and then you put it on like something like netflix i think it really could propel certain things in a certain way so i'm, I'm almost Hesitant on going right into the my thoughts on each movie because I, I, I kind of want to get across the setup of this and that I am intrigued and I'm almost excited that you, you don't have to go through the certain loops that you went through before and maybe there's a change happening even if, if it's something I'm not particularly super fond of or I love even if it was a uh, procedural uh, crime show, which I don't watch any of those. But I know they're good in, in that sense. I'm just not in the mood to watch them, or it's just not my cup of tea. But I'm not going to sit here and rag on them and give them a, you know, why is there eight NSCI, NCISs, and whatever. Although, it does occur to me sometimes in my head, but all right, there's a lot of cities. So, I'll get, hopefully I got that out of the way without being, um, too all over the board. This this part I didn't really, you know, get any outline for. I just wanted to get my feelings on uh, someone like Zack Snyder having a vision. He's a, definitely a visionary. He's someone who uh, obviously cares about his work and has some crazy ideas and his visuals are, are outstanding for the most part. And then he can get a vision across, get his movies made, and working with a budget, getting tax cuts in California. He's, he's working with the system, and 
it's could be the that thing between when movies were serialized and people went and you know maybe before and after the depression era it just feels like it could be a change happening so anyway the movies themselves right the child of fire part one i thought was just a little too um oh a little too segmented for my taste um when you want to get a lot of your exposition, let's say, across, and you're telling the story, it's actually pretty hard, in my opinion. Like, I wasn't interested in the narrator. Uh, it just didn't feel like I, I wanted it at that point, for some reason, although obviously it works in plenty of movies. Sometimes you'll read, right? They'll give you um, something to read with Star Wars with the crawl. But, so, you know, it's okay now, for the most part, the actors are fine. Um, the lead actress uh, is really good. I like her a lot. Uh, I don't know how to say the name, but Sophia Butella. And you've got this sci-fi, you know, fantasy setting in the universe. It's got little shades of uh, serenity when you're trying to blend in things that'll be familiar for people to see like animals and farming but you then you get your spaceship and when you look at the first alien movie it really highlights that every man and everyday man and woman in space it's a you know a minor hauler that can you get that feel this is trying to blend that where serenity did it in such a charming way with everything that was around it that it, it was just almost perfect it's not here, in my opinion, but we've got this military organization, uh, galactic-wide, you know, spacefaring, and they go to this uh, poor planet who's just getting by on their own farming, but they're tight-knit, and there's so many tropes going around as it develops, but this military sort of organization... Is really looking for um, resources, and like I said, there's narration and, and then there's you know show don't tell type thing. But okay, they come to the planet and they force their will on the people. And someone gets killed, a woman almost gets raped, and there's a threat of give me the green. We'll be back in like ten weeks. And that's kind of how the premise of the movie starts. So you've got your, you know, uh, military, the Imperium. Uh, you talk about the Empire, the Mother World type shit you would read on, like, Wiki. But there's a major villain who's kind of um, put on me that I just didn't have... A connection with I don't know why. Um, what is his name? Edward George Green. Uh, I just don't know. Um, yeah, again, I try to chalk things up to maybe not me, but I'm glad it's there. So you've got this threat to the planet. And obviously, during this, it's revealed that one of the farmers has a secret past. And obviously, it's um, Cora, the main character, uh, Sophia Batella. And that's how it starts to unfold. There's a little bit of a betrayal. Like, you know, not all the military people are sadistic monsters. Um, so, you'll get the you know, certain person who defects and joins the villagers. And there's a robot android that, man, is not used enough for the story it could tell, which is why the original Star Wars are uh, great in that aspect of, like, using droids. Uh, and it unfolds, and it's just, you know, when you want your time to talk and tell about a certain you know, aspect of someone's life or, you, or even the planet and what they're doing and how this is being impacted by some unruly space government. Again, you know, take what you will from 
maybe what's going on in the world and how they make their stories. And I'm all for it. I don't care if it looks a little bit like Star Wars or The Seven Samurai. I believe there is a a real good place of honoring something and and loving something so much you want to, you know, evolve that vision. And again, like I said, this could be a dawn of like almost a new age in opinion. By the way, and I'm not a big Zack Snyder fan, so I find myself a little surprised. So when you encapsulate the first movie and you know where it's going, how the villains uh, being portrayed, they have to go out and get a bunch of rebels throughout the galaxy and form a team to combat the the, the Imperium. So I think the connective tissue with this and how they're preparing it when you're going into Slow-mo battles, out of slow-mo, you've got history to tell about a character. I think that's where it falls short. I, I, I found the first one, and for the most part, well, two I'll get to, but there's, there's almost something like a... You dilute certain aspects that you're trying, that you should be getting across. Like, you, you're focused on a couple of things here, but... That wider story, that um, those breathing moments with certain characters, I think they're just misplaced here. Uh, again, you got hectic stuff going on, slow mo battles with gunfights that are just ridiculous. And fine, yeah, no stormtroopers can't shoot, but I just I find myself like this is a little overboard for you know what you're trying to tell. But okay, they go around you know recruiting people and at at this point i'm wearing thin on some of the just the way they're telling the story and the villain's portrayal and the, that aspect of the movie again it's trying to get that you know rural homeland village you know planet getting by and enough grain with like you can tell they're tight knit and you know have a strong community and the the spaceships and the, the, what would be space battles or high tech. So you know when it's revealed, they do this thing, they go around, and as you start to learn more about Korra, like I, there's not enough distinction made on the first movie. So spoiler. When you find out that she was part of the Imperium, adopted princess, basically, protector of the real princess, they don't make a clear-cut indication of she kills the child, or is well, you don't get to see the whole thing, but it's when everything's revealed between part one and part two, is she being compelled, but she being brainwashed, um... Or did she feel she had no choice? Did, did she have an inkling that the child was more than basically what she was? Because, spoiler, spoiler, in the second one it's revealed that, um, oh, your child, you think you could kill the child that easy? This was special, you know, the one type person. But if if the driving force of this character is... I was part of this military period. I was adopted. Even if I was indoctrinated and went through this thing, I was forced into a situation where I betrayed my emperor and his wife and, and child. And I, I literally shot the child myself. And you're found years later, or it, you know, the camera pulls in, or the movie magic. I think it should have been done a different way. I don't think you um, have this character go through this development. It should have been a reveal of her almost betraying, you know, almost getting to a certain point and then realizing her life's been a shambles and um, finding that goodness in her. Whatever. I just don't think by the time um, the first movie's over, 
and the villain who knows she, who she is, the scar giver, and you know, how she betrayed everybody, and you know the secret she's keeping. Mind you, this is a um, sometimes beautiful um, portrayal of um, space junky goodness. It's you know laser pistols. You get a little weird with the weapons, and they can glow. But okay, look, I am not against someone coming up with a vision, and it mimics this, and it pays homage to that. And they're going to tell their story, and someone is able to give them the budget and whatever, make it work. It doesn't really have to be for me, but I try to keep that honest with... I'm not really enjoying this first movie. Even when you get to the climax and who's going to agree to help, um, in the middle of things helping, one of the people they go to help, the brother dies. And as the characters are set up, you don't want to see it at that aspect, at that point. It should be a, a second movie type thing. And So, again, you can have your vision. You can have it laid out. It looks beautiful. Some things could be a little overused, but, hey, if it's your thing and it works that's fine and i'm totally for people it's just becoming a cult thing for zack snyder because maybe it'll be a cult thing back in the day for john carpenter which is one of my favorite um directors so i'm okay with that and you've got to get these group of people to come together um to defend the village Although there's no horrible acting in that sense, some things just don't feel right or fit for me. That's kind of something you're going to have to deal with with movies like this, I think. You, you ensemble cast and you know, you're playing with the um, Seven Samurai theme or uh, the Magnificent Seven. You've got these big baddies coming back at a certain time. We need a certain amount of people who are rebels who will fight against the Imperium. You know, blah, blah, blah. And as the main villain here in this movie um i didn't like where they went and i'm all for making like um you know that part of the military like british type things or england where you know star wars did it great I, you know again i'm not i won't get I'm not going to be surprised if people really love this i just don't find it um I guess maybe more missed opportunities like than anything. But okay, you get towards the end of this movie. Who's going to agree? How do they gel together? Some of them were great. Um, uh, but like the, the nobleman, blacksmith, I didn't buy. You know, and there's, there's a couple of um huge... Oh, what's that actor's name? I can't know if I can find him. Um, well, there's a betrayal. Anyway, there's so many characters in this that you come across. And like I said, if you just let some things breathe more and stop the little, you know, exposition dumps in certain areas, you can really have up the game here. And so I do see promise in it. But. As it comes to be revealed and who she is, Cora, it's a big fight. They have to stop the ship. And Cora's dead set on killing Noble, the, the main villain of the movie. And it looks like she does. Spoiler. Um, it looks like this mission is a success, despite who died. And I get that's part of the thing. I just wish they would have had more impact or lasted for a second movie. Uh, there's a major fight. Again, some of this is really cool. A lot of it's unbelievable. Uh, because if you're doing chaotic Star Wars type battle, you really can't tell what's going on. I'm not saying that the new ones are good, but if you got slow mo, you know, awesome visuals, and you see the sweat on them and the pulses going by, you, you might want to be a little bit more. Uh, vigilant on what's actually happening because it just doesn't look believable. 
like when you should have been shot. Anyway, some great visuals here again, trying to blend the you know surreal space epic with you know rural type everyday people villager type thing, and that gets to um. One of the problems I had with the movie is uh, the character Gunner, uh, played by Michael Hushman. Uh, there's an issue by the second movie that really pisses me off, but getting pertaining to this, it was easily set up. I didn't like it. I don't believe his character. There were some people on the planet I thought they would really kind of highlight. Uh, um... Uh, I think the plan is called Velt. And so this character is along for the ride. You know, it's more of those, you know, I got my bag of gold. Who are we going to recruit? Who's going to cost money? Who just needs to be, you know, persuaded to come help out cause? And there's a ragtag of, like I said, characters. But as you get towards the end and you start whittling down who's left, the climax of the movie, uh, Korra defeats Noble. And really, according to the. The, the, the exclaim in the second movie um his broken body fell on the rocks well it's revealed that they got his they recovered his body um and it's a little okay so you really got to go with things like star wars and uh, serenity and just don't let your imagination <laughs> cloud cloud uh, your vision or your imagination here because there are things like an astral plane or a, a cyber universe. Like, I don't know what the fuck is up with corpse, uh, Noble's corpse. Is it, was it, um, is it more of a cyborg? Is it just like created artificial intelligence? Like, I don't know. But apparently, you can hook him up, get him juiced up, or whatever. Although, <clears throat> They do reveal in the second movie that they're not sure he'll be okay. Uh, but for the most part, the first movie ends uh, a apparent victory for the Rebels. And, you know, say some people didn't make it, but the overall goal was achieved. And, again, as a whole, Child of Fire is really... You know, telling Cora's story about her involvement with the mother world, her involvement with this imperial family, the betrayal of the leader, um, the death of the daughter. And I would have used the robot droid, I think it's uh, Anthony Hopkins. Yeah, it's like Mechanical Knight. And... I really would really use him more as the through line. It just comes out of nowhere, apparently, here and there. And his visuals that are, you know, supposed to elicit certain things. I think he could have done it better, especially in the second movie. And we'll get to that in a couple of seconds. But when I look at the first movie, Child of Fire, an introduction into this world that could be a universe that occupies a good portion of um you know multimedia uh, i don't see it so flawed or you know i try to keep that out of this for that well i'm totally about the truth and i'll just land i'll just fucking rant on something this is not that um there's a slight rewatchability for me actors captivating enough the story's you know wild and um on the borders, at least for me, pretty entertaining. So, Child of Fire is a pass for me in that sense. I bet there are people who like it. I don't. I don't think you can hate this, and that might just be uh, my instinct for people, maybe with clickbait type thing. But looking at reviews when you go to the, you know, um, I wish it success. I wish. Zack Snyder, projects like this, uh, given the green light, I don't know, give it a hundred million. And, you know, that sounds insane when you think of some of the movies back in the day, like Nightmare on Elm Street movies or, you know. I mean, you can make a compelling, 
drama, uh, you know, uh, comedy. But some of these visions of people like Zack Snyder are, you know, $60 million, $40 million. Can you make it work? Can this become a standard of the industry where you can get your uh, limited theatrical release? But it's really going to be a potential network type streaming thing um that gives me that's a little exciting and kudos for Zack Snyder and the people with him to actually do this and I'm not a fucking you know Zack Snyder fan although I do agree bring back the Snyderverse for people yes fuck it you can it, it, there's way too much room that they can you can have this all being occupied by different aspects of DC or the the um, animated movies do really good. Uh, that was always for me the place where you would look for um, really off kilter stuff from um, comic book stuff that you would like, and where people's visions could vary wildly. So the DC animated universe was, you know. For me, uh, a good portrayal of that. But okay, so you got the first movie, Child of Fire. It's decent enough. Too much story here and there, but maybe not in the right places. But the, the mission is a somewhat success with some losses, and we got a return to the planet as the second movie starts. And you've got already it's revealed. Well, it was revealed in the first movie. But here's the extent of um, of uh, Noble's damage, and I was I was a little happy that they went through a little bit more of a system of is he sane? Can he do his job? Type thing? <clears throat> Can he even be saved, or is it just his memories that we're gonna keep? So there's that aspect of that, and I still don't know if he's a fucking droid or um. You know, when they laid out the foundation for this universe, Zack Snyder and his creative team, is it similar to paying homage to certain things where I'm supposed to know that? Um, you give a lot of exposition, and there's a way I think it could have been done a little better, especially with the droid. But, um, same thing, Zack Snyder's movie, his vision, I'm all for it. For that, you know, in that matter of, um, let people do this, get their visions out there, their story, their crazy, wild, sci-fi world. And uh, Okay, so, I think the first movie sat better with me. The second movie, again, if this is a new formula that is just not sitting with me, but it's appealing to people, I get it. Again, these aren't terrible movies, these aren't Things that make me want to punch the screen, or, you know, things I think people are overrating, like that Batman one, uh, where everything's a fucking whisper, Matt Reeves, that is fucking horrible, and I'll say it, uh, and I'll jump on the Zack Snyder in a, in a heartbeat, but I think these are a worthy, you know, shot at trying to make your own thing, and so anyway, Cora, her team, they go back to Velt, and it's it, it's pretty quick in the scheme of things where you find out they're coming back. But um, there's a couple of things in here that really bothered me in the, in the aspect of dinner tables, and we're going to fucking tell a story, and what's your history, and what's your history, what's your history. and when you look at the substance of both movies, this is what I mean by like, some things are just too diluted. Some things are just too focused on with not enough um, care for the dialogue you're using. Especially when you're talking about uh, rebels and, you know, uh, whatever you want to call them from around the galaxy coming together. Um, you know, slowly there are secrets being revealed and when it's uh, looks like a good time, and we we made it. There's no more 
we don't have to fear no more because they really try to put over how desperate this planet village is they don't have like spare uh you know gun turrets and planetary shields you could just tell it was a tight-knit community growing one possibly you know farming the land and then like a fucking huge spaceship and which has tons of sub spaceships that are you know small attack vessels and tanks and men with armor it, not so much in the first one being whatever but you see in the second one as the threat comes it's just it's supposed to be that overwhelming force but again when you're going through again the robot uh, mechanical night where the fuck it is you've got the people on the planet the secrets and this fucking oh again this michael hoosman the love interest for Cora. I fucking hated it. It was so... From the first movie, it was so um, predictable. And in my opinion, bad. So I would say it's a bad aspect of the movie. Not something to rant about, but... Okay, you gotta have this, you know, love interest. Especially when a character comes from the history she did. Again, adoptive daughter, you know, protector of the princess, you know, scar giver, you know, wounding the person and with a history, you know, on the run. Um, I get it. You want to expose her to what makes us human again. And I just think it could be done better. Uh, editing and some dialogue treatment. These could have been, well, for me, excellent. See, I'm not, I'm not going to even say that they're not, you know, just to people are going to love this and they're excellent. But what would have made it excellent for me is a tightening up of the dialogue, a little better editing. and See, I don't know about the vision, like when you're looking at these things as a three-movie project and you might want to do sub-movies and expand the universe. Like, is this a new formula that will eventually will work? It will, it will jive with people and they'll catch on and i'm just old set in my ways i'm gonna give it that possibility um so the love thing really bothers me the it just feels fucking forced and bullshit but lo and behold the villagers find out no they're coming back and we got to train the villagers right there's got to be that <laughs> you know Give this guy credit, uh, Jimon, Gaston, Hansu. He's, you know, big muscle bound guy, but he's been in almost everything. Tons of Marvel movies. I think he even played the same character in uh, Guardians. He played a. Anyway, there are highlights, and there's great portrayals here. Uh, but. It just, uh, you know. I think dialogue can really hurt a movie like this um you know we can go back and watch the magnificent seven even if you're looking at um certain areas of the movie where things have to be told you can't just have people show up or how do they gel together what's that moment that um makes one smile who doesn't smile so much oh the little kid you know so we are balancing that between both of the movies, like the beginning of the first movie, it's a normal day life for Cora until, you know, her secrets aren't known, she's just doing her thing, and then the Imperium comes to the planet, boom. So this one, they come back as victory with some losses throughout the fucking chaos. Uh, some of it's beautiful chaos. And here they realize, oh, we're going to have to train everybody, fight, and you got to protect the planet. It's unbelievable, first off. It's just not... It doesn't feel like there's enough people in this fucking village. That there never was enough people in this village. But, there is some thought put into that with what has to be done. So, they have one little pilot ship. And they, they kind of know they can't have a fucking big fight. And, and a prolonged fight. You know, what, even if they get crates or weapons. 
they could booby trap things and keep things well, you know, protected and uh, foresee things like, you know, fucking tank things coming. And But you've got this big, huge ship, you know, tons of little fighters. There's a, uh, a purpose and a plan that they have to go to that ship and disable its guns or whatever. And it, it still doesn't jive with a lot of things because you'd have to really prepare to leave the fucking planet because this is one ship granted, a, a capital ship, whatever you want to call it. And it's of the maybe it's the mighty arm of this Imperium of the Mother World. You have to uh, guess that there's a fleet of them, right? And once word gets out, anyway, it's not really covered too much. But again, action set pieces visually shot some beautiful to look at but a little redundant in certain areas and again when you're doing whole exposition things about what was my past and we're gonna make a joke and we're gonna bond i think you really need you know expert fucking dialogue and i'm not saying the actors didn't do well like i love uh Sophia Patella in these movies. Um, hate that fucking love interest guy, Gunner. Whatever the fuck, that whole bullshit. It just bothers me, and I think it was done bad. And you, you're swept up in this movie to a certain extent because <clears throat> here are the stakes. Uh, you know, we're here, they're here now. It has to be a wacky crazy fucking battle taking to them on the ship uh noble on the villain from the first one and you're really going between what's going on on the big enemy capital ship and the forces that are taken to the villagers i don't think it's believable enough uh you want to have guys running around with blasters and doing things, and the guy pulls out axes. You know, I get it. I've done it. I have fucking done it. Amalgam, putting things together. Um, you know, I've had friends, you know, take uh, Conan the Barbarian type characters and role play them in the Exo Armor. Um, you know, it can be fun to play in your house and stuff, but when you see it portrayed on the screen and as someone who's role play these adventures i've talked about my gaming um as a game master dungeon master and as a player for over 30 years so i get it but so you know you have to frame certain shots a certain way now, even if this is something that i am excited for with the potential of changing the industry and giving people their vision and with a certain budget and co commitment to it and letting them do what they want hey it's not for me but so the, and that's there are parts of this that are just you know visually stunning uh, a couple of actor portrayals here and there kind of get you but uh, too diluted in certain aspects it's not enough punctuation at certain moments and maybe it's a trial and error but this is the second movie and the stakes are high here there's the battle going on in the ship uh, Gunner and Cora, you're trying to. Because this is obviously, I think the turrets and the major weapons on the big ship are the biggest concern because they'll just annihilate the fucking city or the village, you know. As you know, the villagers fight, all the rebels that they've gathered that have survived. Um, and they got like uh, names like Titus, Nemesis, Tarek, Milus, uh, you know. A lot of characters, some are really good, you know. Um, some are almost too good and then not given enough. You know, uh, Donna Bay as um, Nemesis, the cyborg swordmaster, you know, and some of the connections she had in, in the movie. You again you could definitely see uh spin-offs coming from this or i wouldn't like to do prequels so you'd have to let them survive and just 
keep expanding the universe. Um, I don't think going back and telling the story of Titus, his rise and fall as a general, or, um, the noble guy fucking becomes a blacksmith, or uh, whatever the fuck. Um, I don't know. The fucking uh, Ray Fisher. You can, I don't even know if he's in the second movie. Maybe in a flashback, but he dies. Spoiler in the first one. But his sister comes and joins. Uh, you know, with Devra, I think. There's lots of colorful characters. Uh, uh, but again, you really focus on the battle on the ship, the battle on the planet. What are the stakes? Uh, who's going to die? Who's going to survive? And for the most part, uh, again, you're going to get through the movies. It doesn't feel too long, although I will admit, with the better dialogue and some little uh, can you some editing stuff that, uh, you know, could uh, help a little bit here and there, could have made, could have elevated these movies. But it seems like a lot of budget wasted here and there if you want to tell a story I, I i might have just taken the money and put it to different aspects of the universe you're flushing out uh, so getting to the end of the second movie um skull giver when things are revealed you know the secret she's been hiding and she defeats noble again in the sick battle that you know the ship is listing here and there the explosion going off They've infiltrated the ship. And Gunner, her fucking lover thing. I, I didn't buy it. I just didn't enjoy it that much. But apparently, when this battle ends and the, you know, it looks like they've succeeded, to me, it looks like you just prolonged, you just postponed your fucking doom. It should be like evacuation things or. I don't know, underground fucking things. Because they do try to make the Imperium plays the mother world. It's imposing. And this is just one ship. But, okay. Galactic uh, communications take time. Whatever. But, in the underused droid, whatever they're calling it, Jimmy or whatever, the mechanical knight, it's, um... Revealed that the the kid she killed because I think in this one you see her shoot the kid. <laughs> it, it's just silly in that way. Because like like I said in the, in, the, my, in the first part of this, um, I didn't feel there was a clear distinction between is she just confused, indoctrinated. Um, and then she made a mistake, but she actually fucking killed the child. And watched the uh, mother and father die. You know, she's a protector. And what were the circumstances that actually happened? And when they reveal what actually happened, it just feels wrong. <laughs> it doesn't like... I didn't get that feeling where I felt for... Um, Cora. I mean, Sophia Patel's character is supposed to be your, your, part, it's your hero, right? I, I I don't know. I don't know if this is, you know, again, a, a grittier, real thing. This person was a fucking lunatic. And granted, if she was raised that way, fine. And she gets put to the test, and she only re rebels after she kills the child. And they show, like, a little glow, and... And again, someone in here says, oh, you think you can kill a child that easy? The aspect of this is not hit home enough. Now, I picked up on it in the first movie, and maybe, you know, people do, but I'm going to guess it's something that kind of eludes people, that when the first movie is set up, killing this kid's okay. <laughs> it's fine, because it's just a, a laser blast sort of, her first death, like the Highlands, like it's not gonna matter. Uh, and I thought there was gonna be more of a telepathic astral plane 
type impact on Sophia and his character, Cora. It just looks like she just flipped her shit. It just didn't feel like it gelled well. But they succeed, and their goal now, set, setting up, is to find the princess. So I'm not sure if her essence glowed and isn't another woman. Because then you really, you just killed the fucking child, right? I mean, or is she going to be the same actress, just regenerated or even birthed in another body? Like, whatever that system is, whatever that rule they're creating, I hope it's done fucking well. Because I'm a little uh, disappointed in that. I can see the rewatchability of these two movies, which gives it a you know a thumbs up for me in that way. I'm not finding it you know insulting like some of the stuff I've seen from him, or just you know in your face. But I'm at least coming to the understanding that this is a man. He's got a lot of creativity in certain aspects. He's amazing, and in other ones, you know, it's a setback. Is that a way where you? You know, he's not that old in that sense, and maybe it's that maturing into the in this industry where he'll surround himself with the writers that fit him right with him, who can, can tell him, you know, pull him back here. Or is that what he's doing right now? And just for me, it's not working. If I had to judge, I would say Skullgiver is definitely a, an easier follow for... Um, you know, things you've seen before, um, train the village, the enemy's coming, and it's not really that difficult, although, again, having people sit down and tell their stories, and I'm not really driving with certain actors and stuff, it kind of can deflate the movie, uh, so I might say I liked, uh, Child of Fire better. Isn't that my hopes, my the visual, you know, disparity between, you know, rural play, sea and space, and it going back and forth. Um, you know, that's got to gel better for me. You know, and it might be simple things like, what are they wearing on this planet? What are the space people wearing? What's that blend in between? Does it draw the senses? And this happened with Serenity, in my opinion. You know, it's cowboys in space. Uh, can this be done visually stunning? Great storytelling? Yes. Did he achieve it? I don't think these two parts are uh, a critical uh, success. But, fuck yeah for him, someone giving him the vision. I mean... The money, the the place to do it. Um, <clears throat> I don't think these are a waste of uh, film, if you want to say. However, when I looked for the budget, I was a little surprised. And I was surprised that, like, you're telling me that the second movie uh, was 166, $166 million. It just seems, uh, oh, it's shared with part one. Oh, okay, so both movies, 166 million. You know what? That's not that bad. Okay, so that's actually what I thought originally was I was hoping. You know what? Me even figuring this out right now. Because it says there on the on the wiki, 166 million shared with part one of Child of Fire. So there you go. Um, again, like I was trying to say, I think it has a impact on the industry, giving people the opportunity to do things like this. Um, yeah, it's you know a lot of things going to be a little hokey, you know, a little bit. Um, fake to some people, like my brain trying to figure out, you know, who should have been killed in that barrage, uh, who does eventually get killed, how. 
you have fun with it. I get it. I, I do get that, um, you know, inspiration at times. So in that aspect, I think it's a, probably a success for me. Granted uh, how much of his work I actually like. So Rebel Moon, Part 1, Child of Fire, Part 2, The Skull Giver. I'm going to give it a pass for fun value, for visuals, uh, the balls to tell a story, stick with it. You got um, talent here all over the place. Uh, some things don't seem to work for me, but look, you got to have a love interest. And that's, that's your choice, and you want to ground her and open her up. It was a way to do it. That's fine. But like I try to describe, this movie feels to me at, like, so saturated with visuals and goodness that it's diluted in other places. Like, there's nothing propping those moments up for an unbelievable, you know, action romp that uh, reveals some dark shit. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when it's revealed, uh, she shoots uh, it's the, the princess. It's kind of, you know, wait, it's kind of a... Uh, an awakening moment, and that's when I started thinking about what what was actually told. What was her drive? Was she just indoctrinated? Was it just uh, brainwashing or telepathy? Who the fuck knows? And when I get my hands on those new Doom uh, reboots or whatever like that, I'm I'm probably gonna find that there a lot. So anyway, <clears throat> do I recommend Rebel Moon? Yes, I think I do. I don't think it's going to be for everybody. I think it's going to be um, split amongst um, people who really enjoy his style and gravitate towards that. I think they're going to love this, to be honest. It's not in a delusional type way. That I would say, like, you know, parts of that Batman Superman movie and Man of Steel, for the first fucking 60 minutes of that movie, or more, it's garbage. And I'll say it now, you know, I don't really care. But I'm happy for this. Rebel Moon, give it a shot. I think there's uh, aspects of it that can really work for people. And it's got a little bit of everything. Yeah, you got your little, little love story, your you know, Magnificent Seven. And I don't mind that stuff. I don't really get crazy with it, so... You know, I'm not one to really complain. Yeah, good. Uh, again, I hope this uh, gives the industry, gives people a uh, eye opener for a commitment and a budget and someone's vision. You know, do this for a lot of things. Uh, someone, you know, give them the canvas to do their painting, and I'm all for it. Uh, I think part one might be a little bit better, but part two, is, you know, it's you got their moments. In any case, uh, that'll be it. Doing part one and part two in one podcast might be a little long. But I appreciate it. All right, everybody. I'll talk to you all next time. Take care.